have you all here. My name is Robi Senderovich. I manage our global public administration unit at the World Bank, uh, which is responsible for this uh, GovTech forum, the first one that we put together. And just to take the polls here, how is the level of energy today? Huh? Yes? They told us that GovTech is always full of people with energy. I hope that is true also tomorrow afternoon, okay? So, so to begin with, we know that we have people from governments, raise your hands if you come from a public sector institution. We have people from civil society, think tanks, universities. We have people from the private sector, international agencies, World Bank staff as well. Yes, great. All of you are welcome here to Washington. So I'm not the facilitator, the moderator for this event. That is my colleague Andres Falconer, who is going to take over uh, shortly. But to begin uh, this uh, forum, I welcome uh, my director. So be careful. He's my boss. He does my evaluation. Okay. His name is Arturo Herrera, who is uh, going to start us up uh, with the forum. Right. So thank you, Arturo. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, good morning to everyone. Actually, I think he should have a start by saying, raise your digital hand, and we should have some, some place to actually check it. We, we have a really, a really exciting program uh, over, the night, over the next two days where we are going to see what are the modern approaches to go tech around the world, uh, an approach which is pretty much citizen-centered, an approach which is very open, both in their engineering and ar 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 architecture, but also open in the sense that most of the databases now around the world are allow the private sector, NGOs, citizens to actually interact with them. It's, it's a two it's a two way thing, and it's really it's really the modern GovTech. It's about how to make the life of citizens easier. But that's not the way actually all this started. A few decades ago, what, what, the, what the primary versions of this was about is about how to make the government's life easier, not a citizen's life easier. It was about how to make in a digital way what the government was already doing, their accounting, budgeting, payments. And that's okay. It, it's not bad. It was a huge thing. I'm sufficiently old so that I actually witnessed when public officers were actually paid by check or in cash. And, uh, but, but that was not the only purpose of that. Uh, while uh, the, the ability for governments to have budgets that were processed uh, in a digital manner, it actually also helped to macro stability because that meant that governments were able to trace the level of expenditures. And that was really important after the debt crisis of the 80s after the debt crisis of the, of the 90s, and although this is not anymore a novelty, it's important now that we are seeing debt pressures in many, in, many, in many countries. This was just the first phase of what is now, uh, uh, what we now call GovTech. Then we moved to the e-government, and that was really about starting to digitalize things, and it was really a strategy that was user center. And when I came for, uh, for the first time to the bank, uh, we have a different kind of term. We were, uh, we were talking about digital government, which was really about how to have a, do do a, a, a double way interaction uh, with citizens. And now we have GovTech. And, and let, me, let me just mention the, the boss goals, and you will see why, which is about citizen center, whole of government approach, and, imper and interoperability. But we often lose uh, sight of what does this mean. So let me give you an actual example of what I live through when things were not of a whole government approach and interoperability. Almost 20 years ago, when I was a, a teenager, I, I was fin finance secretary of Mexico City, and one of my main responsibilities was actually to manage that, that, that car property tax. There are 2.5 million cars in Mexico City. So under my, under my responsibility, we manage a whole database of, that, of, of those cars. And the key, the key in terms of, of, of data management for the cars were the, was the, la, the license plate. But the license plate was not issued 
by the Secretary of Finance, it was issued by the Department uh, of Motors and Vehicles. So we have another department, another secretary within the same go government of Mexico City running a 2.5 million database for the same car. But after the pollution experience in the 90s, and Mexico City was implemented and is still in practice to have cars have to pass a pollution test twice per year. So there's another database run by the environmental secretariat about the same car. So each car in Mexico City is tracked in three different data, uh, the, the databases owned by the, by the same government. Now, the funny part is that if you ask any of those databases how many cars are in Me Mexico City, you get three different answers. And very often we, we, t we think that GovTech could help to save, to make things more efficient, but to make also, to provide savings. So we, we think when we are very ambitious that we could have savings of 5, 10%, 15%. If you think about this example, the, the city of Mexico is spending three times as much, 300% what they should be doing, because they are running three times, uh, they have three different teams, three different sets of databases, etc. So this is a little bit what we are doing that. Behind these words, interoperability, whole of government approach, lie very specific things that could help citizens and governments to operate in, uh, to operate in a much more efficient way. We are doing this around the world. We are doing it at a moment in which the technology not, not only allows to do much more, but also COVID, one of the very few things that came out of COVID was to catalyze digital operations around the world. And to talk to you about that, about what were we doing and how we're doing do that in the context of, a, of a very, uh, in a very complex context of multiple crises, I want to welcome our managing the director of operations, Anna Birti. Great. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you, Roby. And good morning, everybody. And congratulations for coming together. I know this was created some time ago, but it's actually your first time to be together, which is great. And I'm really happy to be here to, to be able to welcome you. I want to start really by thanking our co-hosts, and we have several, which I also think shows uh, the strong uh, commitment and interest in this topic. So let me start with the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany the Ministry of the Interior and Safety of Korea, the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs of Switzerland, the OECD, Amazon Web Services, Digital Nations Group, and the MIT Gov Lab. Also, a special welcome to our GovTech global partners representing government, civil society organizations, the private sector, and international development agencies. The theme of our discussion over the next two days governance in a digital era could not be more relevant, relevant to today's foremost development challenges. As we navigate through today's world, we are confronted with the impacts of numerous global shocks that have affected us all. From climate change to high debt burdens, inflation, rising poverty, and political instability, these shocks are leaving an indelible mark on our societies. Unfortunately, developing countries and the most vulnerable populations have borne the brunt of these impacts. As countries strive to get back on track to meet their development goals, the strategic value of GovTech, or using technology to modernize the public sector and to enhance the quality, accessibility, and accountability of service delivery will only grow. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw how governments were able to use technology to monitor hotspots and to continue delivering services, accelerating digitalization in many countries. During conflict, technology can be a lifeline to services and information. In Ukraine, for example, the DIA app is providing 21 million users with access to digital IDs and passports, birth certificates, and over 70 government services. The impact of digitalization on development and governance cannot be overstated. While digital government alone cannot solve the institutional and governance challenges present in many countries, it presents a valuable opportunity to promote sustainability, resilience, and inclusion. Yet, 
Capacities to harness technology to design, implement, and monitor these solutions are uneven, especially among developing countries. To help build government, its government's digital capacity and modernize the public sector, the World Bank launched a GovTech Global Partnership in 2019, bringing together governments, practitioners, development partners, civil society, and the private sector. I'm really pleased to share that the world, at the World Bank, we are supporting nearly 400 projects on GovTech and digitalization more broadly, with commitments amounting to over $120 billion. For example, in Albania, over 500 transactional e-services are now available on the e-Albania portal, reducing the administrative burden for the government, citizens, and businesses. In Argentina, 17 million people will benefit from government efforts to enhance the functionalities of the digital system by leveraging data analytics, providing training for 700,000 government staff. And in the Central African Republic, core government services for finan public financial management and procurement have been enhanced with support from IDA, our fund for the poorest countries. As part of overall efforts to support sustainable, resilient, and inclusive development, we're working to improve the inclusivity of digital technologies in the world's poorest countries. This has been a priority under IDA to make sure that poor and vulnerable people and those with disabilities can access services and participate in government affairs. Technology can also play a role in promoting sustainability and meeting climate objectives. Paperless government, accessible from anywhere, and cloud-based solutions can reduce east waste and greenhouse gases. Of course, digitalization can also bring additional challenges and risks, such as cybersecurity and data protection. Ensuring that systems and services are secure builds public trust and can increase uptake. This forum gives us an opportunity to examine the latest solutions to key development challenges, including harnessing green technology, leveraging digital technologies in fragile and conflict-affected environments, increasing digital skills, and promoting the use of data for the public sector to deliver to its citizens. I'm encouraged to see a wide spectrum of partners represented in this room today. Having strong institutions to lead, political commitment to reform, and the skills and culture to support organizational change are areas where we all have a role to play for the future of the development of GovTech. Let us continue to work together towards building digital capacity and overcoming challenges to ensure that technology serves the public good. With this, let me wish you all the best for what promises to be a stimulating and productive forum over the next couple of days. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Arturo. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, as uh, Robbie mentioned, my name is Andres. Andres Falconer. I'll be your, your Master of Ceremonies for the next couple of days. My job is to make sure that we keep the energy level and that we do see you through uh, till tomorrow afternoon. So I hope, I hope you're all here. Thank you, and apologies for the, uh, for the delay in registration. I think that's a lesson learned for everybody, that the early bird gets the breakfast. So please make sure, please make sure you, you, you arrive swiftly. We have challenging transitions and a packed schedule in between sessions. So, uh, so please collaborate with us to, to, to make sure that we, we are on track. Uh, I will review and, and make some announcements after the, the, the following session. We will review the agenda and, and look through some housekeeping um, issues. But uh, without further ado, I would like to call on Donna Andrews, our moderator for the next um, panel, who will call our speakers. Thank you very much. to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, fantastic. Well, welcome um, to this inaugural GovTech Global Forum. Um, what I might do at this point is I might ask the, the panelists for a first session if you could join me on stage and um, we'll, we will get started. So as everyone is making their way to, um, to, to the stage, 
So I'm the global lead for public institutions reform in the governance global practice here at the World Bank, and I'm delighted to be the moderator for this first plenary session. So a very warm welcome to everyone here in the room um, at World Bank headquarters in Washington DC. It's fantastic to see a room full of people again. I think we've really missed this um, after, after COVID. So it's wonderful to see everyone and having traveled from across the globe to join us here. I'd also like to extend a very warm welcome to our global audience. Um, so we have a global audience joining us on World Bank Live. So we're very glad that you've been able to connect as well from wherever you are um, across the world. Um, we want to encourage all of you to participate um, in our plenary session this morning. So as we move through, so for um, people who are connected um, with World Bank Live, so you can post comments, questions um, to our panelists through the, the chat function. Um, the World Bank GovTech team are also connected, so they can answer your questions, help you with information about everything um, GovTech related. For our audience here in DC, we will have a Q&A um, section as we move through. So you can start thinking about the questions that you'd like to ask our panelists as we move through. For anyone who is joining the conversation using social media, and I'm sure in a room such as this, that's almost everybody, um, please use the, um, the forum hashtag, so which is GovTech Global Forum, and you can continue the conversation um, and meet fellow participants as we move through. So the digital transformation of government has the potential to, to revolutionise public service delivery, streamline bureaucratic processes and facilitate data-driven policy making. Um, it emphasises, it, it empowers citizens, um, by providing them with access to information, um, promoting accountability and fostering civic participation. However, the digital shift also poses challenges in terms of data privacy, security and the digital divide. And it has the potential to exacerbate existing inequalities, but also to create some new, new vulnerabilities. So in this opening session, we really want to explore this intersection of governance and technology and the issues that are shaping the future of digital governance. So this includes, this includes looking at innovative approaches um, to addressing these challenges, the role of government as a digital leader and the ethical implications of technology in public administration, which is no, no tall order for, for a session which um, is limited in time. So we have an outstanding panel who have joined us for the conversation this morning. So let me briefly introduce them to you. Um, so I will start at the far end. Um, so we have Dominic Favre, who's an executive director with the World Bank. So he represents constituencies of Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, the Kyrgyz Republic, Poland, Serbia, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan and Switzerland. And of course, the government of Switzerland is also a co-host for our, our um, forum. Um, so next to me, uh, Mario Campolago, um, who's the Secretary of State for Digitalization and Administrative Modernization in the Portuguese government, and also a chair of Digital Nations, which I'm sure he will talk a little bit more about. So he has a long history uh, of working with the European Commission and contributing significantly to European initiatives on interoperability, uh, the COVID digital certificate, and the modernization of European public administration. Um, so um, in, the, in the middle, <laughs> um, we have Michaela Sanchez Malcolm, who is the Secretary of Public Innovation in Argentina. So she has vast experience working in academia as well as public and private sectors on digital technology issues. Um, next to Mario is Carlos Centeno, who is an Associate Director of Innovation at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Governance Lab, or GovLab. 
Um, he works at the convergence of engineering, design, technology and political behaviour science to co-develop tech-enabled governance solutions. And finally, but by no means least, um, have joining us Charlie Anderson. So she's a leader of global intergovernmental organisations, worldwide public sector with Amazon Web Services. So Charlie advises public sector bodies on digital transformation, including how technology and innovation drive transformation based on her extensive experience in operational law enforcement. So please join me in welcoming this fantastic panel. So to get things kicked off, I'm going to um, ask Dominic to um, offer some, some short opening remarks. Dominic, floor is yours. I don't know. Ah, yes, it works perfectly. So <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm extremely delighted to be here. Thank you, Donna, uh, for your introductory remarks. And uh, I'm very honored to sit in such a such a uh, panel, of course. Uh, I, ha I am indeed uh, uh, executive director at the board of the World Bank Group. But today I wear more my uh, Swiss hat. Uh, I must be accompanied by quite an important Swiss delegation here. And I will uh, rather speak in that, on, that, uh, uh, on their behalf uh, at the beginning. So let me first highlight that Switzerland has been partnering since many years with institutions such as the World Bank Group to support the digitalization of public institutions and services to make government and authorities more efficient and transparent and services better accessible. Technology has the potential to boost government efficiency, transparency, responsiveness and citizen trust. However, the capacity to leverage technology for public sector transformation is uneven and typically weak in developing countries. There is a strong need for capacity building and technical assistance where we and our partners can provide support. To advance the operations and performance of ministries of finance, tax administration, supreme audit institutions and subnational governments, it is key to assist them in developing and using technologies that facilitate the collection, analysis and distribution of data. The World Bank does so, and so does Switzerland. As the distribution of data can involve foreign authorities or national companies, it is of utmost importance that simultaneously support is given uh, aimed at strengthening the protection of citizen data. More specifically, regarding GovTech, Switzerland uh, supports uh, is uh, dedicated at several levels. First of all, at the level of international financial institutions. It supports global programs with the general objective of assisting developing countries in modernizing their public sector. And this is actually what we do here by co-hosting the event uh, today. Also, Swiss ODA provides financial support to the major global PFM initiatives and advocates for the use of new technologies to improve public finance management and citizen service delivery. At the regional and bilateral level, Switzerland encourages the integration of technological components inspired by international best practices, for example, the use of data analytics to identify irregularities and combat tax evasion, or to use the distributed blockchain registries to improve public procurement. Today's event marks an important contribution to this agenda and a milestone in our partnership with the World Bank. It is an honor for Switzerland to be co-hosting it. I am also pleased to see many, as I mentioned, Swiss colleagues uh, from civil society, from university, as well as from Swiss SMEs here, to bring in their expertise and learn from others. In my view, we have here one of the greatest opportunities to bring together the innovation and skills from the private sector and the academia, together with the needs and challenges from the public sector, and the legitimate concerns, of course, of civil society. Within the board of the World Bank, we always call uh, for strong partnerships and outreach, and I'm quite happy to see uh, that we are re really walking the talk here with this forum. I come to the conclusion of my a bit welcoming remark. I hope this is fine. Uh, the, the, the experts will speak after me. 
Um, but I would I would not like to end without uh, having a, wor a word on safeguards. As much as I believe that new technologies have an incredible potential to support democracy and human rights and foster economic and social development, especially in developing and emerging countries, I'm also convinced that the same technologies used without adequate safeguards and solid governance frameworks may serve to repress, control, divide, discriminate, discriminate and reduce freedom. Yes, new technologies can make governments and authorities more efficient and transparent. Yes, they can make public services better accessible to populations. And yes, they can become real game changers to reduce bureaucracy, uh, to reduce bureaucracy and combat corruption. But as it is often the case, great opportunities bear also quite important risks. We need to be aware to the threats that digitalization brings with. So I'm extremely glad that the topic chosen for this first GovTech forum is now governance in the digital area and not, pure, not just a purely technical event. So I will stop here and I wish the conference a very uh, a great success. I'm convinced that this will be an opportunity to build relationships beyond the service circles in which all of us normally operate. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominic. And I think you touched on a number of issues that I know that we're going to discuss in more detail with the panel. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, unfortunately, Dominic does have another engagement that he needs to get to um, um, at some point during the panel. But thank you very much for being here and, of course, acknowledging the, the great contribution from, from the Swiss government um, as well to, to the forum. So just before we hear from our panelists, we have a couple of short video messages that we would like to share as well. So firstly from um, Dirk Meyer, the Director General for Global Health, Employment, Transformation of the Economy, Digital Technologies, Food and Nutrition Security from the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development in Germany. And also from Lili Tsai, the Director and Founder of the MIT Governance Lab. So can we go to the videos please? Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share a few words today, although my main message is simply one of thanks. My name is Dirk Meyer as Director General Global Health, Employment, Transformation of the Economy, Digital Technologies, Food and Nutrition Security. I am responsible for digital transformation at the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. I command the World Bank for organizing this very first GovTech Global Forum, and we are happy to support this event as a co-host. Digital transformation is top priority for us. The BMZ is promoting a digital transformation that is fair, feminist, and sustainable. Because one thing is certain, the digital transformation is a reality, and it is happening with or without us. The question is, do we put people at the center of the digital transformation or do we leave this process to the free play of market and geopolitical forces? The pandemic, but also Russia's war of aggression on Ukraine and ongoing cyber attacks show us the difference between countries with interoperable and reusable digital solutions and those with siloed and weak systems. Many governments in the world face common challenges. Instead of continuously reinventing the wheel, we should learn from each other, foster reverse innovation and share best practices. With GovStack and our partners from Estonia, ITU and the Digital Impact Alliance, we cooperate with countries globally to support a whole of government approach. GovStack develops the global toolbox for GovStack building blocks. I hope we can join more forces with the World Bank around this global initiative. Our goal is to support the digital sovereignty of citizens, companies and partner institutions so that they can make the decisions for their own digital futures. 
We deeply value your commitment to our common goals and look forward to continuing to partner with you wherever we think we can have a transformative impact together. So I'll end my remarks there except to say thank you for your partnership and your vision. Hello everyone, my name is Lily Tsai and I am the Ford Professor of Political Science and Director of the MIT Governance Lab at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's great to share the stage with these distinguished guests. As the academic sponsor, we at MIT GovLab are particularly interested in how GovTech can be a catalyst for better democratic governance. Democratic governance that is more transparent, more accountable, and more responsive to citizen needs. MIT GovLab is an applied research group and ideas incubator that aims to improve democracy and governance by changing practices around corruption, government accountability, and citizen voice. We partner with in-country practitioners at every stage of the research and learning process, from theory building to theory testing, with the goal of contributing to a solid evidence base that strengthens the overall field of practice for participatory governance. As you embark on the next two days of learning and exchange at the World Bank GovTech Forum, I'd like to pose some food for thought. Given the global challenges we are facing, economic uncertainty, political conflict, declining citizen trust in government, climate change, and also what we have learned about the potential for innovation, technology, and collaboration from the COVID-19 pandemic, what does the next generation of GovTech look like? How can new technologies fundamentally transform the relationship between governments and citizens for the better? And how can we work together with governments, civil society, and academics like MIT GovLab and others to study and test ways in which technology might improve democracy and governance? Answering these questions will require a future thinking approach. It will also require opportunities to try out new ideas and room to fail. At MIT, we know from experience that this cycle of innovation and learning is how you have scientific breakthroughs that can change the world, and we look forward to collaborating on the next generation of GovTech. So thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, and I wish you a thought-provoking and constructive forum on governance in the digital era. Wonderful. So with those, those welcoming um, messages um, completed, let's get to the conversation with the panel. Um, so let me start, Mario, with you. Um, so perhaps you can share some reflections about how technology has affected the way that governments work and what are some of the key challenges and opportunities that arise in, in this digital era? Thank you very much, Donna. Um, I'm very pleased to be here and thanks for the invitation. I'm also very pleased to represent the Digital Nations Group and to be a co-sponsorship of this first event. But um, as you did in your intervention, maybe I'm not just Mario here, I'm also a long-standing official of the European Commission. I'm also State Secretary and I'm uh, on top of that an enthusiast and a believer that collectively, collectively I stress, we have a high degree, I would say, of responsibility in moving this dossier of GovTech forward. Um, so um, the motto of this session is particularly important, uh, and, and um, um, I think that both in Portugal or in Europe or in the digital nations context, uh, we realize that the digitalization, acceleration of the digitalization of the government is, 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 is taking shape every day in a more uh, decisive way. But the question maybe that some of you will raise is, has the technology affected the way governments work? And maybe we'll consider that not as much as I would have liked, certainly not as much as some other sectors that have been completely disrupted, but a lot, a lot. We are in a journey that started with concepts like e-government and then successively passed to digital government, and then we have disruptive technologies and using the power of data. 
this is a journey that unfortunately, as some of you has already mentioned, has been fooled by the COVID-19. Uh, but also, I think that we have to be fair on that by the efforts of leading academicians, thinkers and practitioners all around the world, and I feel proud to have in the Digital Nations Group uh, to count on a number of them, that makes really this journey irreversible. I thought, as Donna said, to put forward three, let's say, challenges and three opportunities that, from a governmental point of view, are particularly important. Summarizing them very quickly, I think that the challenges are around access and inclusiveness, enabling uh, a, a digital uh, data-driven culture in our organizations, and thinking a bit about the human control over machines, if I may say like this. But opportunities are certainly to be able to provide public services that are tailored to the needs of the citizen, maybe reorientating the focus of our workforce, of our public servants, and certainly, last but not least, promoting the trust on democratic institutions. So, obviously, I will start from the needs um, of access and inclusiveness, because not everyone in the world has access on equal footing to the opportunities of the digital age, or even know how to use the tools that you make at the, their uh, disposal. We, we must not leave anyone behind, including populations with a disadvantage, elderly, disabled bearing, but also people that for economic or gender reasons may be uh, put aside. Divides and inequalities of any kind are, in my view, inevitably a backlash, and uh, we must work to ensure that this is not the case with the digital transformation of public services. In Portugal, if you allow me for a second, we have put forward the aspect of mediation, complementing, therefore, the digital services with a mediator that will allow populations with some uh, 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 challenges to access the services uh, that we provide, and we foster a lot of gender uh, balance in the engagement of the design and the use of these technologies. But also, I must say that in the context of digital nations, in various forms, we collectively agree on this simple motto, leaving no one behind. However, we also agree that this is a very, very big challenge and a continuous one. Let me move to the second uh, challenge that I wanted to share with you. You know, enable a change, a data-driven culture. This is absolutely fundamental, a culture of sharing data, of overcoming silos of the public administrations by focusing on the centrality of the citizens, on its events of life, should really be, in my mind, the center of all our actions. Furthermore, uh, public administrations will not be able to provide all the services that the society and the economy of any country may require. Therefore, uh, both providing open data for the private sector, for the academia, to complement the public services provided by the public administrations, as well as strengthening the ability, both technological and legal, to use data from private sector, especially when it has a public interest, are two central challenges. And they are at the core of any GovTech initiatives. We need to persuade ourselves, but also to persuade our public leaders that this is absolutely important. We should also involve our servants, our public officials. They have ideas about how data can be used to improve the services. This is absolutely important. We said already, piloting first, extending then, the scaling up later on. Um, I think that is very important that well, in Europe it's certainly the case, but I think that in most of the continents we become more aware of the importance of regulations about, around privacy, ethical use, uh, cyber security, and should be in this context that we use, uh, that we promote the use of data. And again, will not be a surprise for you if the Digital Nations motto for this year is better data, better society. Let me then tackle a little bit on this challenge about the relation between humans and machines. Well, we are now in the core of the uh, exacerbation of the use of chat GPTs and other AI technologies or tools that appear in the market and that appear to solve all the problems from one day to the other. But I think that it's very important that we maintain this consciousness that humans should remain on the pilot seat throughout the entire experience of a digitalization of the companies, of the public administrations, re-engineering the processes, identifying the tools, um, looking at the ethical aspects, etc. And uh, that will be always space for humans to override any technology or procedures that we put in, in motion. 
I think that this is fundamental to ensure and promote trust in the system and avoid, again, societal backlashes, again, technology delivery. And you will note that, again, in the digital nations, we are all uh, sponsoring the idea of the human-centered approach. approach. Mm -hmm. Now, if you allow me very briefly, there are also opportunities, very good opportunities. For me, one important is this advent of the tailor-made public services around the events of life, contextualizing the relations between citizens and the public administration in a bidirectional way and in a frictionless mode because we are now able to streamline most of the processes and information requests by implementing what in Europe we call, and I think generally speaking, the once-only principle in a very effective way, avoiding that the public administration requires several times the information that we already gave to them or that they, have, that they, they may have generated in the context of their work. But this is also means that we will not provide a single unified, unique service to everybody but essentially that we can leverage the digital transformation public services to provide them in a way that fits each citizen in particular, its needs and its context. This way, I'm sure that will improve public services usefulness and uh, we deliver actual uh, public value, added public value. But we need to create opportunities to reorientate our public um, um, workforce to focus on the tasks where they are really irreplaceable. This means that, well, you will know that uh, governments have been criticized um, that their services, the workforce has become monotonous, apathic, uh, even in some cases inhuman, uh, not addressing really the, the problems. So this is a great opportunity. The digital transformation may allow us to return some of the empathy and resourcefulness that comes from being human back into the public workforce. Why? Because we can achieve this by deploying digital tools first on tasks that are repetitive and objective rather than case or context specific or requiring a human interaction in a sequential and sometimes not easily foreseeable way. Finally, we should use technology to promote trust in democratic institutions. It has been very often mentioned that technology may erode actually the role of governments and produce significant institutional changes. Even though some take a doomsday scenario approach to this issue, I'm personally particularly inclined to believe that trust is essential, essentially an asset which you could leverage or destroy according to the way we communicate and the way we transparently uh, make our actions and objectives clear to the citizens. Technologies may be the tool as well as the weapon, and if we have seen its toxic effects on democracies, I believe that we start grasping the opportunities for civic, ethical, and democratic participation as it, brings, um, it, as it goes into practice. In the digital nations, we want to reinforce the trust on the democratic institutions based on common values. And the various initiatives around human rights, for example, in the digital world, you know, recently in the Latin America uh, signed the charter, also in the European Union, are in our view uh, very important underlying factors for our, for our for my optimism, I would say that, like Winston Churchill um, said a long time ago, it's not much use being anything else. So I'm an optimist, and I believe that working in these multi-stakeholder environments will push the limits of what we can do and will bring us together in defending a society that is economically viable, that is uh, equitable, and that is sustainable, and that allows the humanity to progress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Well, we will, I'm sure, all carry your, your message of optimism, particularly over the next two days. I think there will be, um, you know, a huge amount of optimism generated. Um, Michaela, let me bring you in at this point and perhaps pose the, the same question to you about, you know, the, the, the impact of technology on government and some of the challenges and opportunities, particularly that, that you're seeing in Argentina. Okay, thank you so much, Donna, for introducing me. Thank you, everyone, for being here, colleagues, and, of course, authorities from World Bank. It's an honor for Argentina and also for me being here and sharing this information, projects, and programs with you. Uh, according to Mario said before, um, I think right now we have a really big opportunity to keep putting on these tables or several tables 
something that for us is really important, and that is that we need to keep working on bridging some gaps. We had a lot of them. Um, when we talk about gaps, we need to, to talk not only about access gap, but also using gaps. And of course, economic, social, and geographic gaps. We have different contexts, and we are all together from different countries, organizations, and organisms, and I think it's really good to put this on the table, because we also have the gender and diversity gaps. We are more than the 50% of the population in the world, and we need to keep reaching places uh, on academy, enterprises, companies, organisms, such as civil society, uh, organisms too, and of course, public sector. And I need this good to say that we are a lot of uh, women here, but we need to be more here and in every forum. Um, after that, uh, I really like to share with you some of the principal um, programs and public politics that we have been working in Argentina, of course, with the support of the World Bank. Uh, they are really important for us. Um, I don't know if you know that, of course, you, you won't. Um, in Argentina, every single government act is based on our digital platform. It means that for a note or a document or a memo a file, a resolution, or even a president decree is based on our platform. We cannot use paper. It means that we have uh, a particular framework um, that says that we need to use the platform and we need to use our digital signature solution. So we have transparency and we are really more efficient uh, building uh, files and documents. When an organism needs to, I don't know, start um, a buying process, we need to do it by system. When we have the solution, we need to use by the system. We need, uh, if you, we need to exchange information, we need and we have to do it using our platform. Uh, and right now, this platform is the, um, the most important uh, critical infrastructure in Argentina, it's the bigger one. And all our data, it's in our country, in our national data center, we, we are building and improving also with the support of the World Bank. And that's really important politics for us. But it doesn't end on the national government. It's a really important work on the federal and the, the central government. But we are also working with several uh, states or provincial governments and also local governments. It's a really big country, Argentina. I think it's the eighth largest country in the world. And we have 23 states or provincial governments. And we also have more than 2,000 local governments. There are plenty of local governments. And uh, in that places and in that governments, we need to improve the use of digital, the digital uh, platforms and digital services. And we are doing that. Uh, we created the federal problem for digital um, improvement. And right now we are working with 50 of the, 15 of the 23 provinces. That is a lot for us. And we are working with hundreds of local governments. I think that is a really innovative way to work. It's uh, federal. It means that we are working faster and better and we are sustainable. We are not using paper and also we are more transparent. And we are a developing country. In this, in this country, in this kind of country, we can also work that way. And that's why with the support with the World Bank and also other international organisms, we are start thinking about um, collaborate with the whole region. We have um, similar contexts in Latin America, and I think it's time to let's work together and let's work more. Uh, I would like to, to share with you two more cases. Uh, firstly, I know we have a lot of, of people for, for talking about. Um, we have also a really interesting project. The name is Mi Argentina App. Um, it's an application that is free for all the citizens. Uh, about the 50% of the citizens in Argentina are using it. And then you have your digital ID, for example, or you have your driving license, or you have your security document on your phone, and you can use it all across the country. And Talking about also artificial intelligence, we launched a few months ago a national chatbot. The new stuff about this chatbot is from the federal government. There is an, another chatbot um, national in the whole world. So we work 
a lot to, to build our tree of answers and questions. We work with the whole federal government and we did it with a team that is 100% integrated by women from the Secretary of Public Innovation in Argentina and we are really proud of it. Okay, so for this part, I think I'm done <laughs> and we can move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So Carlos, let me bring you in at this point. So you work with governments and um, non-government partners in trying to solve digital challenges. Um, so what are some of the strategies that, that governments can adopt to ensure that they're effectively harnessing emerging technologies um, and also improving governance and, and public service delivery? Thank you. Um, I'm glad Mario mentioned uh, the academy, the academia as a, as a potential partner for some of these things. Um, I think um, to be able to harness, uh, well, let's let's put it this way. I think by nature, technology uh, by default is uh, it seems to be always ahead of us, right? Um, um, and I think um, academia has a role to play there in bridging that gap between the known and the unknown before it gets out of hand. Uh, and I think the governments here know um, what I'm referring to. And I think. Um, we are, uh, I'm encouraged to hear some of the advances that we're seeing with the governments that we're working in, but we still have quite a way to go. Um, I think trust, um, I forgot what the statistic is, but trust has been declining, um, uh, trust in governments have been declining in the last 20 years, uh, which is of concern. It's not, um, it hasn't been improving with um, the advances that we've been making in uh, digital governments or digital transformation of government. Um, so I think um, academia can play a very important role in uh, um, helping governments to harness uh, these technologies that seem to be getting ahead of us by uh, helping us understand uh, what it is that um, is important uh, for, for society, for the relationship between uh, government, citizens, and civil society to make that relationship more transparent, more accountable, uh, more responsive, um, and it's it's difficult. It's um, it takes uh, design. It takes intentionality. How do you build the technology um, in a way that it's going to be transparent? It's going to be accountable, responsible, and it, and it basically reflects our technology. The technology we build should reflect the society that we want to build. Um, we're often caught, I think, in, in the governments that we work with. Uh, and I think everybody can empathize with this, is uh, the pressures of, of government, the um, lack of resources, the, um, the expectation that everything needs to work uh, in terms of technology immediately. Um, and I think uh, if, if, if we can take a step back, and I think this is where academia plays a role, um, take a step back and evaluate um, what it is that we want to design. Um, I think that's a very uh, important thing to look forward to um, when we are trying to design um, the governments that we want in the future, the societies that we want in the future. Um, so when I hear uh, Micaela talk about uh, some of the applications that they've developed in Argentina, when we work with um, the government of Nigeria and the Ministry of Health to develop some of these technologies, um, I think there is a, a lot of pressure to get things right right away. Obviously, we're using public money. Um, but I think uh, uh, one of the challenges um, in harnessing this technology is having taking the time, uh, taking a beat, to say, to uh, to really experiment with these technologies before we put it out there. Um, and I think academia can be a, a partner for that to um, to test what we haven't uh, seen yet uh, from these technologies. Thank you, thank you. Charlie, from, from your perspective, so you're obviously working with governments a lot as well, trying to help them to solve some of these digital um, challenges. What are some of the, the strategies and recommendations that um, part of your work in trying to help governments to more effectively harness um, the, the technology that's available? I'm actually going to start with something a little bit different, Donna, if that's okay. <laughs> sure. So Mario started or finished with a Winston Churchill quote. I'd like to open with Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility, and tie that to culture. So 
I've been at AWS for six years now, and prior to that, I was a police officer. That's really important to me. That's my foundation for how I approach things. Within the AWS world, within the Amazon world, we live to our leadership principles, one of which is uh, success and scale bring broad responsibility. So great power, great responsibility. And if I reflect on Dominic's uh, opening remarks around the, the power, the guardrails, the trust, and then the loss of trust that we see over this last 20 years, what we really need to be doing is collaborating, talking, sharing, and also thinking about trust in partnership with risk. Risk is one of the key factors. If we continue to do nothing, the risk is still there because as we've already discussed, the world is moving, technology is moving at such a pace. So we do nothing, there is risk. We can do something, we can try something, we can try it in a small scale, we can iterate and if it doesn't work, we can stop and we can say, that's not the right approach. Small iter iterative approaches to technology solutions. If I think to the very first question that you asked us, the, uh, the digital world that we now live in and the impact that that has on governments, and it's already been reflected about Ukraine. For the Ukrainian government, they had to make a critical policy change within days of leading up to the invasion. They had to change their policy around how they operated. And as a result, that government was able to build the Deer app that serves their citizens with more than 70 applications, tax registry, land registry, financial access, that app was incredibly important, is incredibly important, and will continue to be. But the government had to take a risk. They had to change something fundamentally critical in their policy to be able to do that to serve their citizens and to serve their community. The impact that that has on that government and the society is massive because it's a trusting partnership, a trusting relationship, and they'll continue to iterate on that technology and that app for the future to come. And I think the really incredible thing, because it is when you think about it during all of that conflict, the most incredible thing there was the speed at which they did that despite an invasion, despite the humanitarian crises that they were experiencing. They can only do that with incredible technology, with an open approach to embracing the technology, which may pose a risk, but when done and done properly with guardrails, with policies and everything else, better serves its society. So I think for me, and listening to the panel and the conversation so far this morning, I guess the, the question I would ask everyone in the room is, what risk would you be willing to take in order to build the trust with the citizens and the community that you serve. Because if you're not willing to take that risk and build that relationship, sadly, that trust will continue to erode. Technology is here, the innovation is happening whether we want to or not. The reality of it is this is the world that we now live in. We take technology for granted. I am a mother to a 15-year-old girl, the world is scary because of technology. I don't need to teach my children how to safely cross a road. I have to teach them how to operate safely in the physical world, but also the virtual world. They're two very different worlds, two very different sets of rules and safety mechanisms that they need to learn. And all of that will continue to explode, continue to evolve at great pace. So. What risk would you be willing to take with whatever it is that you do to serve your customers, your citizens, your community, your people in order to build that trust?
Thank you, Charlie. L let me take that, that thread of, of, of what you've started there about the, the risks and I guess the challenges that come. And I think in my introduction, I mentioned things like um, data privacy, security, really the ethical use of technology as well. And maybe, um, maybe Carlos, I can go to you first. And you know, how is it that, that governments can start to balance those two things? And you know, Charlie also talked about the, the element of trust within there as well. So how is it that governments can balance those, those two things to really be able to make the most of it, but also to have those sort of safety and, and the, the guardrails as well? Yeah, I think, um, um, I think we have to, uh, well, I'm not a government, but I, seeing and working with governments, I think when we are designing this technology, co-designing this technologies, um, they're, they're trying to be intentional about the technology that they're building and who it's serving and what the purpose it's serving and what the cost of the actual problem is, um, as opposed to running around with a solution looking for a problem which is uh, common. Um, and by that, by uh, understanding the values of the society they want to create and, and working with the, um, the people who are at in the front lines when we work with the Ministry of Health in Nigeria, with the health workers, I think they try to understand um, what it is they want to build, first of all, and for, and for whom and what those values are, to build that relationship and a relationship that's ethical, so there is a technology that is ethical, um, that is transparent, that is accountable to those citizens. Um, I think um, we can, uh, in some instances, build a formula where um, if we want a technology that responds to citizen needs, and it does it, and it does so in, a, in an ethical way. For example, we want to be thinking about um, how um, that technology um, uh, serves in a, in, a, in a moment of crisis, like during the the pandemic. And that um, during the pandemic, the pandemic, we saw the cracks in the system in many places. And and that's because of the initial stage, the design stage, the moment uh, when we were supposed to be intentional about what we were building. We didn't necessarily think about um, society as the user. Um, we, maybe we were thinking about, uh, thinking about efficiency or delivering a better service. There are components that are very important uh, that we built into this. Um, how, that, how the data is used, how the data is protected. Um, we're going to be talking about, I think, tomorrow on interoperability of data. And I think that's a, more than an opportunity, a challenge right now for a lot of governments. Um, how do you make that work in a way that's um, ethical, that protects the, the data of citizens? Um, and it goes back to what Charlie was saying, uh, in a way that um, how much are you willing to risk of your, of your own citizens to build the technology that your, your citizens need? Um, and I'll close with uh, something I want to insist on is, how do you build the partnerships, the unorthodox partnerships that exist out there? And I'm, I'm going to say academia, but there are others out there, civil society organizations, for example. But how do you build those partnerships so that you can de-risk that uh, small trial, let's say, um, so that you can then take that to the population, uh, avoiding the mistakes that you could have avoided if you were to test that? Um, and, and one example that I really um, loved of, of something that um, uh, somebody who used to work in the Indian government um, told me in one of the webinars we hosted, um, he said, um, yes, it's, we would love to try small and then uh, pilot and so on, but we basically have to be successful on the first try and deliver to a billion people. And that's a, that's a tough order in the private sector. You have uh, rev almost a fund to experiment, fail, break, fast. I don't think governments can afford that uh, politically um, and sometimes uh, uh, funding-wise. So again, uh, how to de-risk de that um, intentional design from the beginning, I think we need to look at uh, unorthodox partners out there. Mm. Mario, let me bring you on the conversation about this, this balance and the issue about risk. And yes, I certainly, um, Carlos, the, the issue around governments and um, you know, the challenge with trying to start small, trying to fail, moving on to something else is not something that governments do very well, um, at least traditionally. But Mario, what, what are you seeing on these issues? Well, 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 thank you. This is very interesting discussion. Two examples have been given here by 
several of the speakers, COVID and the war in Ukraine. Let me pick up on the risk in those moments of disruption, because it's, you know, we are almost forced, I mean, Ukraine, uh, with, with, with the fact that in most of our countries it raised a lot of thinking about, can I use publicly available cloud to gather all the information of the country? How does this actually put in question the independence of my own country? Although in one particular situation, that was the only way to make sure that that country, not as a physical thing, but as a virtual digital thing, was preserved. So in moments of disruption, we tend to take more risks and we need to take those things to become more organic and to be more, more intrinsic to the way we do. Let me take the other example, COVID. In Portugal, we have, for example, today, an app for the uh, National uh, Health Service that is the most popular app. You know, almost everybody virtually has it. You can fix your rendezvous with your doctor. You can get your medical exams um, there. Um, m maybe more important than this sign is that the medical exam results or the, um, uh, the, the, the results of the exams are shared with the doctors and the hospitals in a structured way. But people can have uh, the history of himself or herself, can ask uh, medicines that are regularly uh, taken, you know, just clicking one button in the, in the app. Why? Because in the COVID, there was an opening. The, the, the citizens open naturally to that thing, you know. If you would have dreamed about doing that without that unfortunate situation or those unfortunate situations, you would get a lot of implication in terms of are we doing the right thing? Who can see this, etc.? So, so those moments of disruption have to be actually used, and I hope that we, tra we take these examples to uh, experiment. Now, in some cases, you can do experiments at small scale, I believe, Carlos. For example, we are now experimenting with AI in one particular context. Portugal is I would claim very advanced, for example, in, in having all the documents dematerialized, you know, the driving license or anything related to your health or social service, but also your citizen card. And you can use it completely dematerialized to authenticate yourself, to sign documents, etc. Now, we have already, let's say, one third to, to almost half of the population using this, uh, you know, the digital uh, uh, key um, uh, enabling the signature, whatever, I mean. But we are using AI to help people to navigate in the process of getting the, uh, you know, the facial recognition, to, to make sure that they adhere to those innovations. It's like using technology to support the adoption of technology. And that can be done in small scale, but I, I agree with you, in some cases, our obligation to provide the same service to everybody forces us to go the long way. But I want to make a final comment, and I think that this is important. Some of the digitalization of the public government operates naturally in the silos that the history have preserved for us and the financial or the social security or the health are improving enormously, I suppose, in all countries. The trick and the most important one where the data is particularly relevant and the interoperability, Carlos, that you mentioned is, is particularly important, is when you start crossing those silos, when you want to know that that lady that is pregnant and that due to her um, economical situation she has the right to an entitlement that's on that moment that the the the, the public uh, administration has to anticipate and automatize the provision of this and 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 i think it was very important the examples of argentina also because you know all of those little things have to have a kind of a nexus, and the nexus is, like you said, the intentionality. We don't do apps for apps, we don't do a technology for technology, we design what we want our, our, out of our country, out of our societies, and that's in this vein that we should develop. So the risk that we have to um, incur are superseded by the focal point where we want to be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mario. Now, just before we go to some, some audience questions, Michele, I wanted to bring you an, in on this as well and talk a little bit from the Argentinian context about this, this balance and issues about risk and about experimentation. Okay. 
I will not take a lot of time <laughs> because we don't have to, uh, too much time. Um, I think uh, according to Charlie said before, uh, we need to, to take more risk for being more trustable. And I think you cannot trust and you cannot live with whatever you don't know. And that bring me back to the access gap. And I think that's the clue. We need to keep working all across the country and all across the region. And I think that's the big challenge for us. Um, I was thinking about some tools and some politics and some solutions based, of course, on the pandemic uh, issues and, and challenges. And we did it really fast, like every, every country in the world. And we also can start working in a different way with the whole population. And I think that's a really good uh, opening to get them. Uh, and I think we need to keep working, not only in, I don't know, awareness campaigns, for example, about cybersecurity or digitalization for everyone. Uh, the workers, the public agents, the industry, but also the common people who doesn't know about the risk that they are taking on internet, for example, or using platforms or getting into dig uh, digital systems. So I need, um, I need to start thinking about that. We need to keep thinking about that. Uh, that's a part, but we also can and need to uh, keep working on digital access, um, finance inclusion, digital inclusion courses, and get people closer to technology, not only digital platform, but also computers and equip equipment. We have uh, several gaps according that kind of, of access, and, and I think that's important too. Um, and another way, another hand, I think that the clue is keep working together, not only public sector, but also the private sector and the civil society. I think, I think it's the base to, to build better op options and faster. Mm, great. And Charlie, let, let me give you the final word before we, we go to some audience questions. So I just want to go back to the start small and go back to my background in law enforcement because in the world that I operated in previously if you get it wrong this is not it is categorically not where you want to be mm. um, and over the last few years we've been working with the UK National Crime Agency and they have a cyber crime unit it's very very small and they did exactly that they were working on unstructured unstructured data, data scientists, tiny, tiny proof of concept to see whether um, these technologies would enable them with their human investigation, and that bit's really important. Mm -hmm. So having built that platform, they were able to gain access to, I'm going to read it, a criminal communication network. So it was more than 10,000 UK users, and that became... Um, an international investigation. And since 2020, using the platform that they built that proof of concept, they've actually done more than 750 arrests globally, and they've seized $74 million in criminal cash, wow. all by starting a very small proof of concept. And so the, um, the person behind that, Greg, actually said during a conversation with customers previously, the risk for them far was the taking the risk far outweighed the not because of what they were able to do and what they were able to change. Mm. And I think when we reflect on this conversation and we think about artificial intelligence, machine learning, ethics, human rights, law, they're all absolutely critical for us in terms of the way that we operate. And so for us, we have actually published a guide around machine learning, responsible use of machine learning, but we have to recognize that this is a rapidly moving technology. So it's always a starter. We're always going to have to go back and ask ourselves, what guardrails, what legislation can we use? And when I say we, I say that as a police officer rather than as um, my current role. As a member of society, what are we going to do to keep our community safe? And so I'd just like to finish with the the values of the equality, the privacy, everything that is so important to us globally as society should continue to be protected. We at AWS, we can't see customers' data. We don't know what is in their data, but we work with our customers to really protect their data. And we can guide around 
the approach that you might want to take, but it's down to individual countries, like the Argentinian approach to technology. It's down to those individual governments to actually think about how to protect their citizens without being scared of technology, because the technology ultimately is the thing that is going to help us to save the lives and support our citizens. Mm. Wonderful. Um, thank you to everyone. I think there has been some great sharing of um, international experience here, which is, of course, one of the purposes of, of this conference. So thank you to everybody. Now, we are running short on time, of course. Th this conversation has been great. We do, I think, have an opportunity to probably take maybe one question. Um, so there's a first hand up there at the back on table 20. If you would use the microphone on the table, please. You are the, the lucky questioner today. <laughs> can you hear me? We yes, can. perfect, excellent. So this question is actually for Carlos. So Carlos, you mentioned that in the last 20 years there's been a decline in trust in governments, yet technology it's, that's when technology started coming into our lives at scale and into governments. Again, not, governments not in the same scale as in the public sector. Why is that and is there any correlation with that? I'm very curious because the whole purpose of technology is to make our life much easier. Thank you. Very good question. I don't have a definitive answer. Um, I think the yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's a causal relation, but I do think that there is something to be said about the gap that's been growing uh, between citizens expecting governments to behave in a certain way and the technology that is available to citizens. I, I talked to somebody in, uh, in Sierra Leone uh, last year who, who was asking me, just as an example, um, why is it that I can uh, was it, uh, order food on an app here and track where it's coming and demand that it comes back or that I get my money back, um, but I can't do something similar with uh, government services. Um, and I think uh, there's something to be said about the speed of technology, and uh, uh, Charlie, you can talk a lot about that, in the private sector and how government is able to, with the little resources it has and the little time, to, to test things and, and make sure that it's right for the public. Um, uh, to be able to to harness uh, to 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 use it and harness it um, for society, so um, I think there is um, this gap manifests itself in different ways in different regions of the world, but uh, I think it's something to think about. I think it's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't know if others have anything to say yeah. about that. Charlie. Um so I love the question, um, and I don't have a definitive answer either. But I do, I do think that Carlos's point around the fact that you can order food, you can order a taxi, you can track yourself and share where you are with your friends. These are things that our future generations are growing up with as life. It's it's life. My children don't believe that we used to have that weird dial-up internet because they take for granted the very fast broadband speeds that we are very fortunate to have. And I think what that does is it really does drive the gap because if I can do all of my banking on my phone, which I can, if I can transfer money around easily, why can't I actually report a crime through an app or get a doctor's appointment through an app because clearly the technology is there. And I think when society sees the technology being so accessible for so many things and yet they can't access a government service, it becomes frustrating. And that is what drives that trust erosion in my personal opinion because we're frustrated with the technology we live with but the technology we need from our governments. Mm. Um, Michaela, did you want to have a final word um, on, on this question as well? I think we, we need to do it. And in Argentina, we are doing it. With, the, uh, for example, Mi Argentina app, we can schedule the visit for a public hospital. Uh, on the public sector, it's easy to work with maybe the, um, the the union between different sectors is the, more, the most challenged uh, situation, I think. But uh, in my perspective, we are 
making some steps and we are making them faster than before and with the support of, of course of the World Bank and other organisms and with the commitment of the society and bring them solution and bring them also information about the solutions. I think it's a very good opportunity to increase the digital services and the digital trust from the citizens, give them solutions fast and, and in a good way. Mm, great. Uh, Mario, I'll come to you finally. Yes, j just obviously reflecting the same as my colleagues in this context, but highlighting two or three things. First, we are talking about the government as a whole, an institution that is bound by a lot more um, uh, contextual legal frameworks than the, and I'm not being negative on that, than the small startup that starts a business where actually neither me or neither the young son or daughter of uh, Charlie would be worried about the information that is disclosed. I mean, you know, you know, we all have this conundrum between I don't want my government to know where I live, but I give to to social networks, not to mention any, everything <laughs> about me. So, so th there is an aspect of education that was already alluded here. But apart from this, this area of technology and the use of technology, and I'm obviously looking forward to adopt the models of tracking where is my process in the administration, like I know where is my goods uh, arriving home. I, I'm obviously fan of that. But, but I want to say that there is another aspect that is important, and with OECD we are working very much in this context, and this is the participatory mechanisms for engaging people. You know, this is not just technology, it's engaging with people, it's listening to them and being able to implement. Obviously, in Portugal, for example, we have a long history of creating the Lab X, an experimental lab that has a multi-discipline uh, approach to try to understand what are the real challenges of the citizen in one moment of their life. That's, that's important, but what in some cases I know that the, the, the society said is that we speak and we are not heard, or we speak and the answer from the government is not that, that fast. So we have to work on the technology, but again, on how do we want to build our society and, and, and leave the opportunities for co-creating the new services, because engaging communities, academia, uh, you know, um, other kinds of uh, non-governmental uh, uh, organizations is the right way to create services that are more f f that the citizen feels as their own services. Wonderful. Well, these, of course, are themes and topics which will be explored much more over um, the, the next two days. But please join me in um, thanking our, our wonderful panel for, for this opening plenary session. Thank you.